podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hi, I'm Melissa Clark, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. The waiting lists for care for transgender children in Australia are growing. At the same time, public debate over medical intervention is becoming increasingly toxic. Today, the ABC's Patricia Carvelis on the battle over the bodies of trans kids and whether Australia's approach is the right one. PK, you've been speaking to lots of kids and their families about gender dysphoria. Can you explain to me what gender dysphoria actually is? Yeah, well, look, gender dysphoria, and that's not a new concept, it refers to the psychological distress experienced by those whose gender identity, the way they understand their gender, doesn't match the sex they were assigned at birth. So... We know that increasingly this seems to be something that more young people are experiencing or identifying with or able to recognise symptoms of it. But what is life actually like for kids who are experiencing gender dysphoria? Really hard. I did meet a couple of young people going through the process of getting officially diagnosed with gender dysphoria and uh, the medical intervention process that then can follow. One of the kids I met was a lovely trans girl called Brock. I'm Brock Wilcox. I'm a 14-year-old trans girl and I live in the Western part of Sydney. She has been officially diagnosed with gender dysphoria. A psychiatrist did that. First, she thought she was perhaps gay because she didn't have the language for what it is to be transgender. I started realising that I was different mainly in primary school. But then she realised that it was a much more profound feeling, which was very different to just sexuality, and that she felt like she was a girl. I always, like, imagined myself, like, having long hair and putting on makeup and, like, wearing dresses, and I would always be like, oh, I wish I was a girl. But I would be disappointed to find out, oh... You're a boy, you have to stay like this. Brock's mum, Renee, noticed she was drawn to things typically associated with girls, although let's not just stick to sexist stereotypes. Girls can do lots of things, (laughs) and I think that's really important. But Brock's mum always noticed that Brock was different. In preschool, I'd come and pick her up, and she'd be a princess and and dressed up and pushing a pram and wearing the fake high heels. Then Brock started changing, wasn't bubbly, wasn't outgoing anymore at the end of primary school, started really seeming quite depressed. I tried going to therapy to try and explain this and try to be like, why do I feel like this? So Brock's mum sought help eventually after Brock came out to her as transgender, and that was a really brave moment then was referred to Maple Leaf House in Newcastle where she started receiving gender-affirming care. Okay, and PK, we hear this term a lot, but what exactly is gender-affirming care? Yeah, look, I think it's really misunderstood, to be honest, in my exploration of what it is. It's about meeting the person where they are. Before you even get a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, it involves psychiatrists and psychologists actually figuring out if that's what's going on. If they are then diagnosed with gender dysphoria, it can lead to gender-affirming medical intervention. And that's really contentious, Mel. Now, in Brock's case... She was prescribed puberty blockers. They essentially stop you developing the hormones of the the sex you were assigned at birth. But puberty blockers have become quite contentious around the world. They have side effects. They can include reduced bone density. Now, Brock's mum, Renee, was absolutely informed about these risks and said that she made the decision with her child, Brock, that this was the right decision for Brock. Obviously, you wouldn't want to rush into treatment when you're just finding out that your child is transgender. For us, it made sense. Um, The fact that Brock had been going to a psychologist 
for quite a while was reassuring to know that it's not um, a phase, so to speak. So PK, the debate both here and overseas has been pretty polarised. That's a fair characterisation. Oh yeah, I think it's a I think it's a good way to describe it. Look, it's incredibly polarised, and I think it's a really important discussion to have. There are some genuinely good and important questions here around uh, the medical intervention, its risks, its benefits. All of that needs to be uh, discussed. I think really thoroughly. But if you look at the political dimensions of this, because it has become a culture war in the United States, for instance, at least 20 states are moving to ban or restrict gender affirming care for young people. In the UK, the NHS has restricted puberty blockers to children, saying there is not enough evidence to support their safety or clinical effectiveness as a routinely available treatment. To be clear, That doesn't mean they won't be available. You'll just have to be part of a clinical evaluation or research to be part of it. And in Australia, what about here? Well, good question, because in Australia is where our story is. Now, in Australia, it has put more pressure, I believe, on Australian gender clinics to show that the treatments that they are offering are evidence-based. And that is a reasonable question to ask. I spoke to Dr. Stephen Stathis from the Gender Service at Queensland Children's Hospital. Last year, for instance, they had more than 900 active patients. He said that most research into this kind of treatment, gender-affirming care, is, is really fresh. He said in, in the last decade, most of this has come out. And his clinic, he says, is constantly adapting to new recommendations as they happen. It doesn't mean that we are locked in uh, to treating a young person with puberty blockers or hormones. It doesn't mean that we are stuck in some ideology. What it does mean is that we're curious and we're keen to explore the reasons why they've presented. Now, Dr. Stathis' clinic has stood down a senior psychiatrist earlier this year following a complaint from a young transgender patient. Can you run me through what happened in that circumstance? Look, what we know is what's already on the public record, which is that there has been a complaint and that it's being investigated. It is a complaint that the doctor, Dr. Gillian Spencer, is contesting, but she was stood down because of this incident, but actually something else too. She's also been accused by the hospital of breaking their code of conduct as a public servant because she attended and spoke at two rallies, one in Canberra and one in Brisbane. She did stand up and spoke out against gender-affirming care. There are massive health risks from these experimental medications and surgeries. We must speak out about the harms we see being done... Okay, so it's clear Dr Spencer has concerns about the approach of Dr Stathis' clinic and we know she's lodged a complaint with the Queensland Human Rights Commission saying doctors like her should have the right to object to the affirmation model for children. So what's the approach that she thinks the clinic should be taking in these situations? Yeah, well, look, Dr Spencer prefers the approach she describes as watchful waiting. She thinks that the current approach embraced not only by the hospital that she works at, but also across our country, is harmful. Watchful waiting is a medical term to describe taking time to see if a problem resolves before intervening. That would involve um, engaging with them, um, treating mental health comorbidities, engaging them in therapy, and trying to get them connected to peers and activities that help them to feel good about who they are. I think the vast majority of child and adolescent psychiatrists have serious concerns about the affirmation model. I spoke to Professor Ian Hickey. He's obviously really well known in the mental health space. He says that there is no evidence that simple psychological therapy alone is a legitimate alternative to what's being offered through most of the specialist clinics in Australia. Exploratory psychological therapies, family therapies instead, watchful waiting, are not evidence-based. They are the sets of intrinsic beliefs of different professional groups. He does say that watchful waiting carries risks for young people because obviously some of them are are in incredible distress, Mel. They are really, some of them are at risk. 
When it comes to gender-affirming care, there's often concerns raised that it's not reversible or that it might lead to decisions, medical decisions being made uh, that lock people in to a decision that can't be changed and how can we do that with young people? I know in your investigations you've spoken to someone who has been through a gender transition and who has regretted it. Can you tell me about this case? Yeah. So... You are right, detransitioners, as as is the sort of language used, have become a really big part of this discussion. And I think an important part of this discussion because you need to hear everyone's stories. They have, though, been weaponised by people who are against affirming care to really, really talk up the risks of medical transition. Now, they are still a small proportion of the people who transition. We spoke to Courtney Coulson. She transitioned to become a a trans man in her early 20s. I think it's important because our story is really about young people. She did make the decision as a young adult, not as a child. Um, She says she had a lot of issues going on and she says that she decided that life would be easier as a man, that she'd always been, you know, interested in gender play and, and wanted to become a man. I think you can be pushed so far into a belief that these things start to become real. I just went right through the trans sort of production lane there and I stayed living as a man for five years. She said she found it too easy to get diagnosed with gender dysphoria, too easy to get testosterone. Whatever I was going through when I wanted to transition, I seemed to have outgrown it, gotten over it. Before you commit to this thing for the rest of your life, don't you want to see every perspective? I should have been able to do that, and I didn't. PK, you came to this story wanting to know if medical interventions and the battleground that's become, whether that process is the right one. What conclusion did you come to? Is Australia getting the approach right? Look, I don't see myself as the ultimate judge on whether this should continue or not continue. Do I think there should be a mass closure of our gender clinics? I don't think the case has been made for a mass closure, but I think what has been established is that we need research, research, research. We need funding and we need to support young people as much as we can. Stigmatising them doesn't help. Stigmatising their families doesn't help. And having ugly, ugly debates where they are kicked around rather than centred in the storytelling is a really dangerous way to go. What I found was that for young people who are desperate for assistance, people like Brock, uh, this is really helping them right now. I didn't choose to be born in this body and then want to be born in another. Like, I didn't wake up one day and be like, yeah, I'm trans. It was years of dysphoria, self-hate, that it took me to find out you're not in the right body. Patricia Carvelis reported this story for Four Corners. You can catch her full report on iview. This episode was produced by Veronica Appap, Flint Duxfield and Sam Dunn, who also did the mix. The supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Melissa Clark. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. You can find all of our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. Thanks for listening. <laughs>